So let's go ahead and pray as we start this morning and dig deep into the Word of God. Our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray, Lord, that you will speak through me this morning, that the words of Jesus may be lifted up, that you would stir in our hearts a desire to want to meet with you and to hear your words and that we may be open and accepting to that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Newt Overbay, psychologist and neuroscientist, in his article, Learning from Mistakes, How Does the Brain Handle Errors?, uh, found along with his colleagues that the brain creates a specific kind of brain activity when a person makes a mistake. This activity is called error-related negativity, or ERN. It happens almost at the same time that the error is made. The brain is very sensitive to mistakes, and it produces a specific type of electrical activity called ERN. It is as if the brain already knows we are making a mistake. Within fractions of a second before we are even aware of it, whenever the person makes an error, a special pattern of the brain activity shows up, a sharp negative electrical activity that is strongest at the top of the head. This Negatively charged electrical brain activity happens very quickly after an error and signals the detection and processing of an error. A curious thing about the ERNs is just how quickly it happens when we make that error. So quickly, in fact, that it happens before we are even aware of our mistake. The ERN usually occurs no later than 100 milliseconds. It's one out of a thousand of a second after an error has been made. It's like your brain knows you have made a mistake before you do. And, but here's the interesting part, that many scientists studies have found that after making a mistake, we respond more slowly the next round. This might be because the brain is trying to give itself one more time to avoid making the same mistake again. According to Dr. Elizabeth Romer, professor of psychology at the University of Massachusetts in Boston, in her article, Mindfully Making Mistakes, she writes that making mistakes can naturally lead us to feelings of self-consciousness and self-criticism, which can cause us to withdraw or stop trying. Isn't that just right? That's the current reality that we live in our postmodern culture that's constantly bombarded by idealistic progressivism, a society that responds negatively and triggers to us in our feelings of guilt, shame, and frustration. When we don't get it right or when we make a mistake, which in turn leads us to disconnection, anxiety, and depression. Because no one that's gathered here has ever made a mistake. We always get everything right. And when we look back at historiography, meaning the way in which history was written, we learn that this is nothing new for long ago, in ancient times and throughout the ages. This is something that humans have often dealt with. If only there was a way or someone who could guide us to avoid the pitfalls of this world and lead us towards a flourishing life of goodness, of hope, of shalom, peace, and joy. A flourishing life. Hmm, that sounds good. Not just a life of striving and surviving, but thriving. In Scripture, we find that God wants His people to flourish and to experience peace and joy and community and love. 
but sin destroys community. So God sends his prophets often to warn people so that they would turn from their sin and destruction. But we find that Israel often refuses to listen, and so they experience awful consequences for their ways. But we also uh, find that when Israel listens, they receive God's promise, mercy. Um, Author Ellen White uh, writes, Although Israel had mocked, the, as the had, had uh, mocked the prophets and the messengers of God and despised their words or misused his words, he had still manifested himself to them. The he mean God, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth. Notwithstanding repeated rejections, his mercy had continued his ple- ple- pleadings with more than a father's pitying love for his son and care. God had sent to them his messengers, rising up bedtimes and sending because he had compassion on his people and his dwelling place. We are now in our series in the book of Acts, and we have been going through the book of Acts over a period of months now, and now we are heading into chapter 6 and chapter 7. And here, in this particular part of Acts chapter 6, we are heading into how people react to the message of Jesus. How do people react to the message and the claim that Jesus is the Messiah? And what we learn in the first few chapters is that people who claim to be followers of Jesus start getting persecuted and rejected. And the interesting thing about the Jesus message is that the Jesus message is is offensive. It's like Jesus, the message of Jesus shatters whatever is true and whatever we like and whatever we want. Because when we come close and we approach to it, we come to the reality of what Jesus is talking to us and is speaking to us. And so since Jesus' message is so offensive, he gets killed. And so that's really what the book of Acts is all about. Remember, we talked about that the book of Acts is the history of the New Testament. It's relating what are the early Christians did after Jesus ascended to heaven. And we find, and it's showing us in this reaction, we find that there's this little minority, this humble community that is created of believers, that those that followed the way of Jesus, this group, starts spreading and starts growing and and gaining momentum. And I would invite you to open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, at the beginning of chapter 6, we see that they are facing challenges. And they're facing challenges with the Greek widows and they're being overseen in the distribution of food. So they start complaining. And so they choose a a few deacons. And this is a new office. In the original language is diakonia, which is literally means service, to make sure that they take care of what is valuable. But one of these deacons we see there in the passage that is named is Stephen. And Stephen, whose ministry had expanded beyond distributing, distributing food to the widows, was a that guy. He who preached with holy boldness and confronted the powers that may be. And then the story that we see here this morning, we see that while he's preaching, some Jews that had a lot of power became really angry at him. And they rose and they raised false witnesses to make sure that he was locked up and he was sent to prison. And so now, before he is there, before the highest Sanhedrin, which is what? the court, the highest court in Israel. And he's trying to defend himself and he's quoting scripture as he has ever done, that he had been with Jesus. And the scripture says that what was the response of the people? They responded with stubbornness. They were resistant to the message. And if you see there in chapter 7, Acts chapter 7, 
you would see him starting off to give us a history lesson of the whole Old Testament of the Hebrew Bible, starting with the Torah, with the Nebiim, which is the prophets, and the Ketubim, which is the, the writings. And he's staying the relationship that God had with his people from the very beginning till this time. And we see that the central figure that is portrayed in this historical review of salvation was the one, none other than God. He is the one who is responsible. As you go through this passage in Acts chapter 7, we see that all the action verbs that are mentioned in this passage are all God-driven. And he reminds them about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and how all in initiatives for redemption came from God. When he appeared to Abraham and brought him to Canaan, the promise to give him land and posterity, he reminds them about Joseph and how God swore the plans of Joseph's brothers and sustained Joseph and delivered him from his trials and gave him wisdom and graces of Pharaoh. He reminds them of the slavery in Egypt when he was when 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 it was God who wanted to deliver his people through Moses and he had appeared to Moses and spoke to him and sent him to deliver his people. Through God allowed people to follow after their own inclinations, he continued to manifest his presence in the sanctuary and in, uh, and, and, and against their enemies. By placing Jesus at the right hand, God demonstrated that the history of salvation was continued in Jesus. For you see, Jesus is the central figure of the Bible. Jesus is what the whole Bible has always been about. God has never abandoned his plan of salvation to save his people, even when their attitudes towards those he intended to save disappointed him, even when they made mistakes. Author Ellen White writes, when remonstrance, entreaty, and rebuke had failed, he sent to them the best gift of heaven. Nay, he poured out all heaven in that one gift, the Son of God himself. So on one side, we have God's love, his mercy on display for his people. But on the other side, we have people who are stubborn, who are stiff-necked, who make mistakes. And Stephen says, as he's being approached with the Sanhedrin, why are you persecuting me? I'm just following Jesus. And Jesus is what the Bible is always about. Go with me to Acts chapter 7, verse 51. And when, Jesus, and when Stephen says, Why are you persecuting me? I'm a follower of Jesus. See how the people replied. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the direction of the angels and have not kept it. Stephen reminds us that history repeats itself. For the Jewish leaders were just like their grandparents. They were no better off than their forefathers because they also had resisted the Holy Spirit. They had pride themselves in the circumcision of the flesh, but they failed to understand the circumcision of the heart. Their forefathers had killed the prophets, had persecuted those messengers. But this, his listeners were far worse because they had murdered the anointed one the Messiah, Jesus, whom the prophet had announced. They accused Stephen of not keeping the law when they themselves had kept to keep it. 
But they implicitly stated that the covenant was broken. But the covenant was not broken because of God. The covenant was broken because of them. They had broken the covenant. God was ever merciful with his people. It's like Stephen is saying, you have been diseased all this time and you have kept. God has been so merciful, sending you all these constant reminders. He has made the appointment. He He has gotten you the heart surgery. And when the time came, you killed the surgeon. You rejected Jesus. This is what you've done. For you see the problem with the human condition is that God speaks to us through his messengers. God speaks through us through his word. God speaks to us constantly. But we don't receive him. We often reject him. And look at Acts chapter 7, verse 54. And they get so mad. And they got so angry. And their visceral and guttural reaction was when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran in one accord. And they ran at him, other version says. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen, and he was calling on God and saying, Lord, Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down, and he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. We see this same trend over and over and over God coming towards his people and his people rejecting him. God merciful, loving, caring. Stephen is presented as the last prophet, begging them to come to Jesus. And if you notice, there are some parallels here with Jesus. Stephen with Jesus. Both Stephen and Jesus were brought before the priests and the council. Both were accused by false witnesses. Both, were men- both mentioned the Son of Man. Both have, cha- have, have been charged with blasphemy. Both commit their spirit to God while dying. They both ask their enemies to be forgiven. It seems like Stephen is like another Jesus. Luke is making notes. It's very clear that this is the last attempt that Jesus is making to save his own people. And God will knock, and he will knock, but he will not knock forever. And all through the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, we see that the Son of Jesus is rejected, and they rejected him. But Jesus, in his his mercy, still sent Stephen as a final attempt to save his people, but they rejected him. And I know that as we read the story, as we're wrapping down and we're wrapping up this morning, we might fall into the trap of saying, that's not me. That's the Jewish people that they're talking about. We're not the ones that rejected Jesus. We're, I would never do that. We are modern people that when the truth hits us, we have a, happily receive it. But what happens when Jesus challenges my perspective What happens when Jesus challenges my assumptions? What happens when Jesus challenges my preconceived ideas? What happens when there's a fork in the road and I must make a decision? Either go to the right, go to the left. There is no middle ground. Because you see, that's what the Bible does. That's what the prophets do. They force us into making a decision. There's a fork in the road. 
And we have to make a decision to see where we're going to go. And when we are pinned against that perspective, how do we respond? What do we do? The words of Jesus, the words of Scripture. But what does this have to do with me? You're probably asking this morning. A lot. Because just like the Jews back in the ancient times, and just like it was in the ancient times, in the times of Jesus, and then even in the early church, we too have a choice to make. As we see and we hear the words of Jesus. If Jesus is challenging our time, what, what would happen if Jesus would ask us to audit our time to see how we're spending our time? What would happen if, if, if Jesus would ask us and, and, and he would question our eating habits and the things that we're eating? Oh, there, now it gets personal. And and we say, oh, we're modern Christians. And we say, no, that would never happen to me. But what about when we're pinned against the wall of reality and we see who we truly are and the words of Jesus are speaking to us? Do we respond just like those Jewish leaders gnashing our teeth and being stubborn and stiff-necked? Or do we respond in humility and love and repentance? There's a word in in Hebrew, teshuvah, which means repentance, which literally means to return, turning back to something we stayed from, looking away from. It is time for us to Settle the matter. Make things right. If I've been running around and I've been running away from Jesus, how long am I going to continue doing that? Let's settle the matter today. God will knock, but He will not knock forever. May the rays in the Son of Jesus pierce our hearts melt our hearts to the point that we are touched by his words. Let's take a moment to reflect and to reflect in our hearts our walk with God. To reflect on the things that are moving us away from Jesus and those things that are keeping us away from intimacy with Jesus. And dig deep into the things that have been moving us towards Jesus. I like how 2 Peter says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but He is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that we all should come to repentance. That's the invitation, folks that Jesus offers to you and to me. So the question is, how will you respond? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we have heard your message. We have heard the invitation. Please stir in us a desire in our hearts to respond to your voice when we're being challenged by the things of this world, by the things that come and separate us from you. May you touch us. May you mold us. May you lead us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.